Hi, this is Deep Tran. Hi, I'm Jose Solis. And we're your token theater friends, people who love theater so much that, you know, sometimes you just need a little break from theater. And uh, and this past week, uh, we took a little bit, we took a little bit of a breather. There's There's not a lot of, like, theater theater that we saw together. So we're just going to do, like, a potpourri, a variety pack this episode of things that culture that we've consumed in the past week and, you know, talk to each other about them, tell you about them, and maybe you'll want to consume them as well. And then who's our guest for this week, Jose? Today, we're going to be talking to Tony winner B.D. Wong, who in quarantine did his own Beyonce and recorded a sound cycle of music videos. (laughs) It's true, though. That's what it is, right? (laughs) Called Songs from a Non-Made Bed. It's a collection of music videos and set to benefit Broadway Cares Equity Fights Aid. So we're going to be doing that. I'm so excited to talk to him because it has been a cruel summer indeed. Oh, my God. I love that you said he he did a Beyonce by releasing a visual album. Isn't it? What? I mean, didn't she like invent that basically? Yeah, yeah, she did. And what I really love is, like, I, you, you and I were both talking, uh, we, we were also both listening to Taylor Swift's new album, Folklore, last week, where she also just dropped it, uh, announced, like, tw- 12 hours beforehand that this was going to happen, that there was going to be a new album coming out tonight, and we're just like, whoa, no one needs publicists anymore. They can just go out into their social media spaces and, and just say, hey, I'm doing a thing. Yeah. Because. But that's not a visual album, which is very disappointing. I mean, she had time, I guess. I mean, not that I want to ask Taylor to do even more. Because, you know, like I am wearing my Stella McCartney Taylor Swift shirt, Cool Summer, for the first time. And I was like, how can you be releasing a new album and new merch when I haven't even worn the merch that I bought for Lover last summer? Like how? But. I mean, I guess also like Taylor, we have no money. Like, stop putting out new stuff when there's no money and people are unemployed. That's not very thoughtful. <laughs> well, good thing it's available on Spotify if you want if you want to listen to it. Kind kind of like how uh, Beyonce's uh, "Black Is King" was released also in July, and Hamilton was released at the beginning of July. And so, if you got Disney Plus for one for at least one month, you could have seen both you know like we love we love a thrifty queen <laughs> i don't think anyone has ever referred to beyonce as a thrifty queen in her <laughs> life but i mean it's always a first time hey a beyonce plan plans everything and so i don't doubt that she that she that the, the releases coincided so nicely yeah that's like a really good point so what have you been watching well, speaking of, I mean, I and I was actually watching Black is King, like over the weekend. And what was really interesting to me about it, like in, in comparison to, you know, the other Beyonce visual albums, because if you're not a Beyonce fan, I am sorry, but the next 15 minutes uh, what's been really fascinating about watching it. And the thing is, I am not qualified to talk about any of the iconography in it. But I, it's so interesting to see the, the evolution of Beyonce's visual aesthetic from Beyonce, the self-titled album, which is very much like, a, you know, the, 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 visuals, were, the visuals weren't um, cohesive. And it, was, it was like a collection of vignettes, basically, around, around a, a theme of like her as a woman, her as a mother, you know, Beyonce the self. And then, and then in Lemonade, it became Beyonce, the spurned woman, yes, but also like Beyonce, the daughter, like where Beyonce come from, which is New Orleans. And then for our Black is King, it was where did Beyonce, where's Beyonce's lineage? Like looking back to where, you know, her ancestry and touching back on, you know, the legacies of kings and queens of, of Africa and how her, you know, present royal iconography that she's been using quite a bit actually with Jay-Z how that's tied into the ancient iconography of you know ancient Egypt and all of those things 
So it's been it's been it's been interesting to see to see her discover her that she that herself as a queen. Well, I mean that's and what people also- have been calling her for like over a decade now. So <laughs> she might as well claim the throne. But you're right about that. One of the reasons why I haven't watched Black is King is because I was I was you know slightly under the weather with my COVID scare uh, last week, and I know by now that every time that Beyonce drops something, it's something that I want to like pay like my full attention to and I didn't want to have like Black is King playing on the background and miss out everything because I would be like typing right or like being on my phone or stuff like I need to find the place to because it's almost like sacred time I think when an artist of that caliber puts something that's so thoughtful and so detailed out because I've been watching the uh like you know photos and screen caps and stuff and just like I'm like holy fuck there's like so many different things going on just in one frame that I can, you know, mm-hmm. my body because of the heat and being sick is not, you know, we're not ready for this jelly just yet. But I'll get to it very, 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 very soon. Meanwhile, poor Taylor, you know, like I, I laughed so hard because someone said that folklore was finally Taylor releasing her Starbucks album, and <laughs> which accurate, but you know, it's very soothing, right? I mean, and I need it to be like soothed and I need it to be like calm. I need it to not, you know, deal with anything like too like big while I was trying to get over my weird allergy, not COVID thing again, uh, thing that I went through. Yeah, Jose's COVID negative, so yes. No, but talk about things that could can play in the background. I feel like it's so sad. It really is. A st- I, mean, I don't hate it. It's like I really, I really enjoy it, but it's 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 interesting. Like, what what do you make of this whole uh, like making like making a gigantic body of work right now? Oh yeah, like you know Taylor Swift released like a sixteen track album that she created during quarantine, and like and and Beyonce's Black is King. You know the soundtrack was really uh, it was released last year, but I feel like with this with Black is King in, in particular the visuals enhance the music even more. And I feel kind of like Lemonade, like those two things are so interlinked that I feel like Black is King is like the completion of that, this African song cycle that she's been exploring. And so like, I I feel like right now, like it's for me, like being able to really sit with it for a long period of time and like a way I haven't been able to sit with art before this has been like a really rewarding time for me. Yeah, because you know, like one of the things that I really love about Lemonade, because in lieu of of watching Black is King, I listen to Lemonade a lot (laughs) over the weekend. And Lemonade is one of those albums that I cannot just like listen to a song. Like I have to listen to the entire album. So Mm -hmm. like, I love that Beyonce has rescued that idea of like an album album, you know, like where you start at the very beginning and you need to go the whole way through. And I kind of feel like folklore is that in a way where I can't just yeah, like pick it's... a song and like go there, but I have to listen to the whole thing. And what's so interesting to me about that is that, uh, you know, traditionally, I would say the kind of history and the kind of stories and the kind of legacy that Beyonce is uh, telling us visually with Lemonade and Black is King, it comes from like the oral tradition, right? So what's so interesting to me right now is that seeing that she knows that, you know, the people who are able to do that are dying and are no longer with us. So she's reshaped the oral tradition by making it also visual. So I love that about her. Meanwhile, Taylor is back to like, you know, like going when she was a teenager with like her guitar in front of a fire, which is also like oral tradition in a way, you know, it's like the stories that country songs are based on like you know they're they're always like storytelling and they're never about just like a boy or like shake it off or whatever like that so i they're both very different takes on the same idea of like passing on stories to people which is what we all crave right now that we have to be alone at home yeah no and i really i I really love that i and i love that idea that you're just saying about like tradition and i feel like with both of these albums i I was like joking to my friends i was like wow beyonce's going to africa taylor's going to the woods they're all just like rubbing it in our faces that we can't go anywhere (laughs) (laughs) like where the hell are we gonna go like camp in central park and try to come up with poems (laughs) and get like but get like covid from like a pigeon like no we're too poor yeah, for but that. I'm gonna, I know. 
but after, for me, listening to both both of them, and I listened to you know one day listened to folklore, and one day listened to watched Black is King, and and for me, I, I just noticed that there's like this. It's not like going back to basics of this is they're going back to where they came from because like they both came, like they both come from like a very like I I. I, I like I wouldn't say folklore is the same sound as you know self-titled Taylor Swift country, but I do feel like there's like an earthiness to it of going back to just like you were saying, like telling stories, and Black is King in particular. It's like it's kind of taking the story of the Lion King, but like transposing it to modern times and also reaching back to like biblical times too, uh, and tracing that African lineage that way and like telling these stories so that the next generation will take them and learn from them and move forward. And so like there's this, there's this, yes, there's like bells and whistles within each of them. Like, you know, Taylor is like swimming with a piano in her music video and, you know, Beyonce's wearing so many, uh, a shit ton of outfits. But there's like, but there's this theme of like story, like, of storytelling as at the root of it and and also going going back as an looking deep down as an artist and see what motivates you and and like the traditions that you came from and trying to take what you've learned from your past and bringing it into the future absolutely because you know i have never been and you know this because i have said this repeatedly on the show i have never been a fan necessarily of plot but i'm a huge fan of story and what, you know, what, what projects like Folklore and Black is King make me think about is the many ways in which growing up, I was passed on what I, le- what I, le- uh, I was passed on what I later would learn were the plots of classic movies were told to me as stories. So yeah, plot can go screw itself, but stories and why we tell stories and why we keep passing them on to the people who are coming next. It's so important. It's so precious. Like I feel like we're like this. We're like an album away from you know just going back to like the wilderness and like wearing like furs and going hunting and living in caves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and and I feel like for these artists, we're also an album away from like really now really discovering like who they are because none neither of these women have given a lot of press about these projects. It's like this. You want to know more about me? Like this is it. It's like, I'm not using anything else to filter my message. Which is so great. I mean, like that way, yeah. like, cause we expect too much from celebrities and like, yeah, you know, like Beyonce, what, has she done like one interview in like the past like five years or something like that? Yeah, I know. It's mostly through her Instagram. Like if yeah. you want to know a little more about Beyonce, look her up on Instagram. And Homecoming also, which is and homecoming. so yeah. incredible. On Netflix. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, if you're, fa- if you were a fan of her Egyptian Nefertiri outfit in Homecoming, you're gonna have a great time with Black is King, and Does all she of wear the it? different African. No, she doesn't wear that outfit, but she wears like a lot of like outfits inspired by ancient African tribes. Not ancient, uh, African tribes and hairstyles. Okay, this is the first. Patterns. This is the first time that anything related to the Lion King has sounded interesting to me because the Lion King is so boring. I don't. It is so I boring. Don't. I don't. That's the only thing. Like for me, that that was the only. Th- they use in Black is King. They use quotes from the Lion King remake that Beyonce was in, and every time they did it, when it wasn't James Earl Jones, I was just thinking, "Oh, you don't, you don't need to, you don't, you don't need Disney in this." Nope. Beyonce doesn't need Disney. Like Beyonce can just take out all those lines, and the thing will stand on its own as just, as just a piece, as just a piece of you know cultural pride. Yeah. So wait, you're not like a huge Lion King fan, even when you were like a little girl. I oh, know I love I love The Lion King, but you know, in it, it, it was never like my favorite of the Disney's. Yeah, I never. Could. But I understand. Yeah, but I I, I understand like its significance to people. I mean, The Lion King round had up until it got shut down because of COVID. Like The Lion King ran on Broadway for like twenty years, and it employed like African performers from Africa who wouldn't have had opportunities here otherwise. And so, I appreciate the lineage. I don't appreciate Disney creating talking CGI cats. Which between I, that and cats last year, it's been a it's it was a, a very unfortunate year for cats. For cats, yes, CGI it, cats. It was, and I never made that connection. Like both Taylor and Beyonce played CGI cats. 
Yes, you yeah. drive me blind. Is Beyonce like a cat person? Because because Taylor is like the ultimate like cat lady. I don't think Beyonce's an animal person. She probably have like a like a I don't know like a pet cobra. You know, or like a or like a lot like a lioness, like a, you know, yeah. like, like a giant animal. I don't think she, but and, and animals are you know they're very unpredictable, and Beyonce likes to be in control. Yeah, I'm sure she could tame like a like a really crazy wild animal. Like she would be like, I don't know, what's like the wildest animal out there? Like Probably. an elephant? Or something? No, because they're so cute. Elephants are so gentle that you know, like a crazy like cobra. Shark or something? A shark? Yes. Like she, I'm sure she could totally like, just be like, look at it and just be like, you're mine now. And the shark would just do Beyonce's, you know, what Beyonce said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like lady of the oceans and the heavens and all of that. Yeah. I mean, and uh, what do you make of of these artists like releasing these gigantic bodies of work right now, though? Like, I mean, I, and because I feel like Black is King was in you know production for like the past year, and they could have delayed it, but they chose not to. And so, do you think it's do you think it's one of those things where oh, everyone's at home, we need to. This is the opportunity to really get the most attention. More than atten- it, like, like more than attention, yeah. I feel like what they're doing is that they're just giving people hope. You know, they're reminding mm-hmm. people that, you know, they haven't forgotten about us. Because that's the thing, you know, like perfectly, like we complain on the show often, like Broadway has decided that nothing is happening, right? And that everyone who does Broadway stuff is like dead, apparently, or like, you know, frozen like that. Remember that Passengers movie with Jennifer Lawrence and, you know. The rapey Passengers movie. <laughs> without that part. But yeah, every, everyone's yeah, like yeah. frozen, right? And they're not. So I like the fact that artists that are so important, like Taylor and Beyonce, are saying, you know, no, like life is going on. It doesn't look like what it's looked like in the past, but life isn't stopping. So here's a here's a present, you mortals. Yeah, The Gift, I believe that's what Beyonce called the that Lion album. King, yeah. The Lion King album, The Gift. I'm like, yep, especially now. And what I love is, cause I think, I don't know, and the reason we're comparing both of them is because, you know, they both release new stuff, but but for me, I like, they both, they, they're both artists who have con- who who got started being controlled by men and now they've taken control of their own production because I don't think if Taylor Swift was under her own her old pro- production company they would have let her do something like this so quickly and I feel like it's something that a lot of other artists of other disciplines can learn right now of you don't need, you can produce these things on your own. You don't need a fancy producer to help you with this. You don't need a publicity machine to promote this for you. You have your own following of your fans and and like you don't need anyone to give you permission to make art right now. Like we're all in front of a computer. We all have, you know, phones. We can all we can all buy an HD camera if we really want to. Like you don't like you can put this work out whenever you want to. A fucking man, which is why I'm very excited that we are going to be talking to BD Wong, who eliminated us. Um, <laughs> can can you think of any other like you know theater person who's done something like this? You know this Beyonce like in quarantine. No, but I keep waiting for it, and I and. BD said, so we were recording this before we seen the videos, but BD said he'll send us the videos. But what I really love is I've been wanting someone to like do a musical on Zoom because I really love the play readings, but girl needs production value. Yes, 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 we do. So let's go talk to BD about this very exciting. I promise not to call him Beyonce. Okay, maybe I will. Do you think it's a gay lemonade? I mean, lemonade is the gay lemonade. No, I'm kidding. No, I don't know. That's like a very deep philosophical question. But yeah, let's call, let's call this a gay lemonade for now. So, and let's go talk to BD. Hi, BD. Thank you so much for <laughs> for joining us. Hi, guys. So nice to see. You. Very nice to see you as well. Uh, so songs from an unmade bed. This is like songs deep, from an unmade bed. Deep and I have been referring to it as. The gay lemonade because it just drops. It's my gay lemonade yeah. that I drop. Yeah. I'm so glad that you said that because it's, like, it's always my 
fantasy. I mean, I think she's just the best, right? And 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 it is my fantasy. And, and Riker, my husband, is really into her, and really into her her video um, uh, vocabulary and her video um, career. And and so uh, that's it's 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 actually not that uh, um, uh, f- passing a reference. Um, but it is like that, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it became this kind of expression of our feelings and our relationship and our um, collaboration and our, the, the, our sensibilities that we share as creative people. And we didn't really get to know what those things were until we started working together. We'd never worked together before. And a lot of couples uh, don't ever get to have this experience and creative couples that do cross the line and work together. That is, that can be real. It's super interesting and 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 rather challenging, but also really very. It, when you come out the other side, you really feel good about your relationship if you do it the right way. Oh my God, you're like Beyonce and Jay Z. Yes, just <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, and uh, I mean, what was the impetus for the project? Was it one of oh. those like kind of like we were talking about Taylor Swift earlier, me and Jose, uh-huh. like offline about. Oh, we need to, you know, artists are trying to figure out ways to be creative, and and you don't, you haven't done a musical in a really long time. That's so right, yeah, and it's always part of it. my mu- musical work and enjoying musicals is always a thing that I always have that I don't get to really do very much at all. And I there's a lot of things that came together. One is that I'd always loved this particular song cycle, this piece. It was done at New York Theater Workshop in 2005. A, a, a great actor named uh, Michael Winther, who's also a friend of mine, um, performed in it at, at New York Theater Workshop. A beautiful, lovely production. It's a one-man show or a solo show with 18 songs, one lyricist and 18 composers. And it was, and it's about kind of, it it it, it touches on the ruminations of a gay man living. Um, in his, he's in his apartment and he's kind of ruminating on his romantic life. That's the basic kind of thing. But it doesn't have a plot. It's just all different songs about different guys or different situations or different emotional circumstances between people. And that thing, it stayed with me. And one of my best friends was one of the 18 composers. So I, I knew it and I went to see it because my friend had written a song in it and I loved it. And I some of the songs were very challenging. The music is challenging. And I've often used it as part of my vocal uh, workout. And I was doing that during the beginning of March when we were starting to quarantine. And I started to feel a sense of resonance in the songs. I thought, oh, wow, this song actually today actually really applies. This song about wanting to go out and not being able to go out, that, that kind of thing. And, and, and song after song kind of had a double kind of meaning after a while. So I thought, oh, wow, I really would like to to explore this material. And I had also been talking to the lyricist, Mark Campbell, who's kind of the creator of the piece, and said, I'd like to make a movie of this. I had done this like last year. And and, and so I went back to him in March and said, hey, um, remember I said I wanted to make a movie of songs from an unmade bed. You know, what if we made videos in our apartment in quarantine? And then the, the goal would be to use the videos and kind of try to use them as a charity for something. And he loved the idea of it, and 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 I played the songs for Riker, my husband, and he loved the ideas. And you know, when you bring a person like a videographer on, an actor and videographer relationship, if the videographer is just doing it because you are making them do it, that would just it's just a recipe for disaster. But if the person genuinely likes the material, which he did, then it's you have a chance to really do something together that's really great. And he he did love the the songs, and and we started to. to to think, well, could we really make 18 videos in our house? And we started doing others, and we just finished them like yesterday or the day before. We just really finished the last one. Um, we're going to stream them next Monday on on um, on August 10th, um, and it's going to benefit uh, Broadway Cares Emergency COVID uh, Assistance Fund for people in the theater, backstage and on stage. Uh, as you know, the theater's completely the rug has been pulled out from under the theater. So a lot of the performers and the uh, uh, artists, not just actors, not just people on stage, but people backstage, um, people hair, makeup, wardrobe, all of these people are uh, many of them struggling. So this is a this is a kind of um, uh, uh, an event, the streaming event to raise money for um, for those that that fund. And what's kind of nice is that the the fund kind of reflects the the spirit of the of the show the show is kind of presenting itself as music videos and it's kind of the the only theater we have now 
know, we don't have a theater. So this is my uh, version of the theater uh, made in my home that I can't leave. And without people there to really be able to watch it in the same room as me. But what else can we do right at this point in order to, to, to entertain people um, theatrically? There's a theatricality to some of the songs, and that's nice. So I, I thought that there was a... Um, I feel like artists were kind of struggling to figure out what to do next. And that one of the things that was kind of happening was people were doing a lot of self-made content, playing instruments in their in their bathtub or whatever. And I thought, wow, that's not going to stay interesting that long. I think it was wonderful. When you started seeing people doing it and the outpouring of content that started has, has been happening, you think that's really exciting. And, and people are not are not accepting the fact that they're they're having to stay home. They're 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 doing they're being them. I'm a musician, so I'm going to play, and I'm going to, I'm a singer, so I'm going to sing. They wouldn't stop being themselves, right? Nothing would stop them. But at the same time, there were limitations that were really strong and are really strong. And I think we're possibly, if this continues on as we see that it's going to, we're going to see people pushing forward and changing the um the changing the limitations that they have. We're all becoming self video makers. Every, you know, all actors started becoming self video makers uh, for the last few years because the audition process as an actor has changed drastically. And, and now we have a situation where a lot of actors know how to make videos of themselves, uh, have the equipment, have the lighting and all that. And so we see a, a kind of a change in the, the, the content and where it's coming from and who's producing it. It's, it's self produced a lot. And what I think is that through um, costume and 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 wardrobe and and things that are in your control but that you wouldn't normally push to the next level if people start doing that the content can become really interesting so that was our attempt this is our attempt at that it's like saying okay I'm not just gonna wear my regular clothes I'm gonna put something on that goes with the song or something and not always but but a lot of times and I'm gonna do my hair to go with the song you know because my hair is really long you know it's like getting really long so that that's kind of it and and so I guess those are the main salient things is that that our relationship really kind of um, was challenged and also kind of was a force to meet the challenge by working together and that um, there's a kind of um, poet poetry or poeticness to the 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 fact that we're in quarantine making this thing about someone who's trying to connect with the outside world or with other people speaking of costumes i was living for when i saw you getting ready to go to like a club that looked like the eagle or something and i went to go uh, out yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and the song that song is called i want to go out tonight and it's exactly you know it actually mirrors the kind of way that we the song was written in 2004 2005 the show was originally done in 2005 it wasn't about covid it wasn't about people being relegated to their homes because of quarantine but he was wanting to go out for other reasons he will he will he wanted to be bad that night the character in the song and so it has a new it has another layer to it but you see that iconic kind of clothing right and you think, gosh, when was the last time I was able to do that? Put on a harness and go dancing, right? <laughs> or, or put on, you know, or go dancing with my shirt off. When was the last time we were even able to do something as what seems so simple as that? So the, 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 the song cycle and some of the videos like the one that you mentioned do um, touch on that. And surprisingly enough, for something that was written in 2005, there are a lot of opportunities to touch on something that we're feeling right now. And in that song, you sing about uh, wanting to do not so bright, you know, not so bright things. And I wonder what yeah. are the not very bright things that you miss doing the most? Well, in in the song, he's saying, oh, gosh, I, I'm, I feel so restricted right now that I, w I would do just about anything, like whatever, you know. And, and, and he's talking about like being with someone who's probably not good for you or something, you know, like a bad boy kind of thing. Uh, what the thing that I, 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 you know, I don't know, what do I... Well, I'm, you know, the things that I'm doing that are bad are like overeating junk food. That's kind of what, where, it, where it is for me right now. But what do I miss? Oh, gosh, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I do miss, um, 
I just miss, you know, I, I'm a tactile person. I, I miss touching people. I do, I do, I must admit that that is a thing that, that I feel very weird about. Like, actually, the impulse to come towards, you know, you see your, uh, we had a, a picnic, a, a kind of social distance picnic for Riker. It was his birthday last week. And we had a, a, about 10 of our friends by the water outside in Battery Park. And we were all spaced out and everything, but we didn't touch each other. It was like, you know, you don't, we're not we're we're not really there yet where we're comfortable touching each other or we feel like it's it's good to probably be better safe than sorry and 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 so but the impetus is there right hi and you see them and you haven't seen and we haven't i've been we haven't been in the same room with these people that we have for dinner over for dinner every saturday night because we have a dinner party every saturday night we haven't seen them and so it that impetus is very strange to kind of not be able to follow through Right. So the last thing at the theater I saw you in was uh, The Great Leap by Lauren Yee. Yes. Yes, which which you also directed like the next year in yes. at Pasadena. Yeah. And because I was thinking about that play actually well because I'm friends with Lauren. And also because like in that play you played a character who did who felt like a follower and not and not a leader. And at the, at the end of the play, like he learns how to like speak up for what he believes in. Yes. Not to spoil the play, and to act to to act um, um, for on his own behalf, for his own wishes, and for what he wants. Yeah, you know, I I haven't really concretely touched on the play with regards to current events or or the the way that people feel now, but it is absolutely a play about what's happening now to people in the world, and and does relate to that. And and I and I do. Um, I think that's why the play is such a good play because these things are always threatening to be our um, uh, on the on the on the on our plate, and and we either push them away as a society or we we get back to them. You know, there's a pendulum that swings, and and we're in a pendulum a place on the pendulum where the the pendulum is swinging to this place where people are speaking up and saying things that they did not say before that there's a more of a culture of it and there's more of an understanding of it and an acceptance of it that actually raises consciousness for people who are very numb people that don't understand like people that were closed down to the whole idea of what me too was all about oh no now kind of some of them kind of go oh i see i see actually that's i see how that the, the math is added up and how i play a role in that math or something that I observe is there that really needs to be spoken up about uh, rather than silence is not necessarily um, just silence. It is actually complicit, you know, uh, what's the word that goes with complicit? complicity? It, complicity, yeah. And and so, um, yes, I mean, and, that, and so that's what's for such a delightful play because Lauren has written a, a lovely play that that's a very deep thing to, to witness the character go through. And I, and I do... I, I think that is one of the reasons why I did the play actually three times. I did it once in New York, once in San Francisco at American Conservatory Theater, and then I directed it at Pasadena Playhouse just last year. And it and it, I think that's the reason why I keep coming back to it, or or enjoyed it so much, or wanted to do it again, is to talk about those themes of of what it means to put yourself on the line and how in, in, integral that is to being human. Like in some ways, you're kind of re robbing yourself of, of of one of human of humans' greatest um, opportunities or uh, aspects of being human by not speaking out. By not, that's a thing that humans can do. And if, if you're if you turn out to be the kind of person who doesn't do that, you're you're not really experiencing your full humanity. And so, a, a plays like Lauren's actually. Um, uh, plays like Lauren plays really always uh, uh, bring people in touch with that. And that's really, really wonderful. I, you know, it's very hard to think about any art about queer Asian men that doesn't involve B.D. Wong. And I wonder, really? yeah. And I wonder, you know, since you, since you started, you know, uh, your career, you know, what has changed the, the most? when it comes to, uh, you know, queer representation that's not like, you know, a gay white man. What has changed the most over my career? Mm -hmm. For better and, and for worse, I guess. Well, 
Let me think about that for a second, because, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, which is really great, is, and to bring it back to this project, Songs from an Unmade Bed, there's one song in Songs from an Unmade Bed, which was about uh, a very specific kind of relationship, which is a relationship between a guy and another guy who has a partner, and how he, the, the guy that he's messing around with or dating, whatever you want to call it, takes on a third person. And and so then he's saying, well, I didn't really mind being the second person, but I don't want to be the third person, <laughs> right? There's a drawing of the line, right? <laughs> and the reason why I'm telling this is because I was adapting the the song to um, the cir- to us making a video of it. And I was trying to figure out how, and when you're making, the part of the, the thing about making these videos is that you don't have other actors necessarily that you can interact with. You have to do, if you are gonna bring another actor in, you have to have, use them remotely and figure out a way to use them remotely and make have them make a self tape and, and share it. And you have to cut it together. It's very complicated. And so in, in interpreting the song, I was trying to figure out a way to say what I felt about that phenomenon of being grouped together with someone else being the third person and what it reminded me of is the kind of racial profiling that happens in gay dating and that people it's great that people have their preferences but but the irritation or the disappointment i always feel when um i find out that someone i'm dating only exclusively dates asian people is always disappointing to me like that's all they want is oh they, that's a, is that's all you see in me is the fact that i'm asian like what about the fact that i'm so dot 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 don't you like that well of course they like that but there's always this consistency and it has to do with race and as someone who doesn't I, i'm not gonna say i don't see color but i don't but when i'm dating someone that's not really a salient aspect of what I'm looking for or I'm initially attracted to or anything. It's it's other things. So I find it personally for me a little off-putting. That's my own personal thing. I'm sure we'll get lots of letters. But so I I took the song and I made the song about not a guy that has two or two uh, other extracurricular relationships, but uh, but 16 and that all of them are Asian guys. And I'm trying to, uh, in a whimsical way, uh, describe this um, phenomenon that happens that only an Asian guy like me would really know, understand. Like when I brought these Asian musical theater performers, these all gay Asian musical theater performers from Broadway and TV and all these different places and put 16 of them together in this number, I explained to them the, the, the rest of the number. and not one person said, I don't understand what that is. You know, everybody knew the phenomenon that we're talking about. And what I'm saying is a project like that, a, a video like this, wouldn't I wouldn't have made it five years ago or 10 years ago. I'm in a place now where I'm self-generating material and I'm actually using my own point of view and my own thoughts and not editing it. I, I mean, I thought for a split second, I might have thought, well, does anybody else care about this or does anybody understand it? And I didn't care at the end of it. I thought, I think this is something to share that is really delightful that other people, when they see it, will recognize it in another, like, I think, Jose, you would recognize it in your way, um, you, you know, from your point of view. We would all take from it something that is recognizable. And that comes from a, the universality comes from very speci- something very specific. And I realized that being very specific in my own work and expressing myself as a writer and all of that is essential. And I didn't always feel that way. And I think if you're asking me what's different about the point of the queer point of view and where I'm, what I'm doing with that and what I, how I care about it, it's evolved. My coming out as a as a public person or being um, an actor was was. Um, clouded earlier on with doubt or worry about what would be the uh, uh, outcome of it. And now there's none of that at all. There's there's just no fear about it or anything. In fact, there's a liberation, of course, that will not be um, foreign to people. Uh, you know, co- the coming out process is a liberating process. There's no question about it. And the, the further you come out and the more, the, the bigger you come out, the more liberating it can be. And I believe that strongly and I feel that and I have seen the proof of it and I love that and that is different that is an evolution of my own sensibility that has 
happened over the years. And so now what I'm saying is that it's involving my actual expressive work because I am a, a, a writer who also acts or an actor who also writes. And that that usually means that I'm, as an actor, I'm just playing someone else's part that they wrote for me and that I'm bringing to it whatever I can. But it doesn't often allow me to be particularly specific. And something like this, this is a really good example of something really specific that is able to be mined from it. I'm going to send you guys the link to that video because I really like it. Yes, it, please. It has really wonderful, you know, just these these 16 guys all took this prompt and they just ran with it and it was really great. Yeah, we just talked to Daniel K. Isaac and he, and he told us he's naked in it, so it's... He's naked in it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And he went, what he did, he told me, <laughs> he did it. And I mean, you know, uh, and naked to the point where it's uh, obviously going to be able to be acceptable to people, to all people. But, you know, I, 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 I you know, I said, I, want, I need 16 sexy guys, you guys, and I want lots of you to be shirtless. And I want to see who will do it and who won't. And, you know, it was really fun. And a lot of them showed up shirtless. And Daniel Isaac, he said, well, how about if I'm in the bubble bath? And and so I yes, be in the bubble bath. I think I wrote in the script that he's in a bathtub or something like that. But then he went to the bubble bath place, and that brings lots of cinematic opportunities that you will see when you see this video. Okay, so what I wanted to ask you then is like, because you're a writer and you've written a book about about like the birth of your son. And yes. so, do you ever think like you'll write a play about like your life or about like something that's more reflective of who you are since those opportunities to play that isn't usually as readily available? I, who knows? I think possible, very possible. I, I, I usually um, don't think of myself as the kind of writer or actor or performer that would go right to the biographical place, like to, to, to be literally biographical. And I, I'm, I'm so I'm not I'm less interested in that and more interested in taking things that I've experienced um, and, you know, for example, like I did in the video. I mean, that's not biographical, but that is that is an aspect of something that I know about that I could write another character's exper experience of. And that would I think it would be more than that, more like that. It would be more of me saying, OK, well, what is it that I want to say or share that I do know about, like right from your own experience to say? And and say, OK, I, I know I know what to say about that particular thing, as opposed to naming the character with my name and having the character be an actor and do, you know, I, that's not interesting to me at all. Um, but the experiences are all really interesting. The, the 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 point of view is the most interesting thing to me. Now, I want to know who would play you. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I did, I just did, I mean, this comes to mind, it's not really the answer to the question, but I just did in season four of Mr. Robot, I did, I had a flash, this big flashback, and Ross Lay played me at 24 or something like that, and um, he was wonderful in it, and uh, so, you, you know, at, at a, before Ross Lay was announced that he was doing it, they, they, they told me that they had cast the part, I thought, well, nobody can, nobody's going to be able to do that. Um, you're going to just have to have me in it and just have to, like, give me some, like, good makeup or something like that. Like the Irishman uh, it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, it turned out, yes, there are people, and they can do that, and they would be wonderful, and there's lots of them. And um, I'm proud to say that as a member of this community. So um, uh, I don't know the answer. It might be Ross Lay. Who knows? Uh I'm really curious about which skill that you uh, discovered that you had during this uh, video, so the song cycle. You're like, huh, I'm actually pretty good at this. Maybe I'll do this more. Oh, really interesting. Um, hmm, let me think. Uh, well, one of, this is hard to describe maybe, but one of, maybe this will make people want to uh, see these videos because they're quite beautiful. And what Reichert, as a videographer, he has always made videos of himself. He's got a dance background. He has an Instagram channel uh, or Instagram feed. And the, the, the recurring visual theme of his, of, of his videos is multiple manifestations of himself in different ways, okay? He tiles himself or he makes mirrors himself. He does all different ways of doing that. And he he is, as the um, editor and as the technician, he understands how to do that technically, and he does it really very well. And so he, what was interesting for him is him doing that on another person, which was me for this. And when I was doing it, I realized that I had a way of storing 
um, the the vocabulary, physical vocabulary in my brain because I do a, a take of a of of a of the song, and then I would say, okay, I could do the take again, but not do exactly the same thing I did before, but it has to be kind of similar. So you know that that um, what's the name of the video that Adele does where she's in that beautiful floral dress and she's kind of I, uh, any, uh, uh, semi love to your new lover. Yeah, you know, it, it, I'm actually not even sure that's the name of it, but it, but it, it, you know what I'm saying. And there's min, m- multiple manifestations of herself singing the same song, and so that we do a lot of that. And it's, it's really fun and it's really beautiful. But I find myself going, oh, I remember what I did, and I so I have a kind of computerized brain about how to. Uh, make it interesting for Riker to cut, but also make it consistent with the uh, uh, style of the other takes and stuff like that. It's a very random kind of thing to be able to do. Wait, do you have like a giant green screen in your apartment? Because like some of the footage, I was like, how did, how, how did, how is it so big? Yes, like- yeah, we had, it's not giant really. We had a green screen and we used a green screen and we used a lot. And we use it in different ways, um, many, many, many different ways. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of strange, a lot of weird uh, coincidences or or kind of fortuitous events happen. One was that they abandoned the um, scandalously closed massage parlor that was below us. Okay, we live on the second floor and in the mezzanine level, there was a commercial space that was a massage parlor and it was unceremoniously closed by the New York whatever. There was a big sign plastered on the door one day and all the ladies inside were gone and they then it was abandoned. And so we used the space. We went down there and we put furniture in there and we we made little sets and stuff like that. We did it a, a lot I and mean, nobody kicked us out. Nobody cared. We were just down there. And it, it was a completely unused space. We weren't really trespassing. It didn't really matter. And at one point, somebody actually was throwing out a bed. And so there was a bed there and we needed a bed because it was songs from an unmade bed. And so we took the bed and we moved it into one of the little rooms and we put it in there and it, it, it is the bed you don't, you haven't seen it in the preview videos we gave you but there is a little room that is the opening of the show and that is a room that we made up with all of our own stuff that makes it make it look like this guy's apartment and the bed was there and so it was like wow there's a bed and there was a tv that someone brought down and it was like we needed a tv so we had a tv and we didn't have to carry the bed and the tv back and forth to our apartment but we carried all the other furniture and all, all of the other props to to the other apartment. So I haven't even forgotten the com- question that you were asking me, um, which was what? Remind me. <laughs> oh, nothing. And it, it was just about like the process of like, did you have a giant oh, green, the green screen? screen? But yeah, yeah, yeah. So and so so that was one of the things that was fortuitous. The other thing that was fortuitous it was that that they and this is a nuisance when when a, when your building is put they put scaffolding over your the the front of your on the on the ground floor of your building and you're under these like pipes and stuff like that and you're always worried about how long it will take for them to get rid of them because they're such a nuisance. But in this case, we, as we live on the second floor, it allowed us to walk outside of our apartment and film our own window, which we could never have done if we were. So the shots of the of the window, of me looking out the window, are me with where I could on the scaffolding because there was a scaffolding there for him to be able to stand on. We call it our deck now because it's like a deck. We <laughs> oh, God, please don't. We go out there and we sit on it and it's like our own, like, you know, private deck in a beach house. Um, so things like that happened. And one of those things, you know, so there was so the green screen inside the house to allow him to change the inside of the house. But the outside of the house is actually our house, our, our apartment. And um, so, but we did use a lot of green screen and I have, I bought a lot of different kinds of green screens. I was like, well, it's medium sized green, screen, a big, bigger one. And then one that pops open, you know, the kind that's, it's got a little wire in it and it pops open and it's portable. Yeah. Oh, I love it because like, uh, I, it's like, I've been craving production value. Yes, that's and I right. feel like you just like unlocked, like how to have production value when you're stuck in your apartment. Yes, thanks. Well, that, that's what I was trying to get at before, which is that I really hope people kind of push into this area. It's not that hard to do. It's not that hard to learn how to do. I was lucky that I had someone who could do it in a big way. Like, Riker really knows how to do it in a big way. And so maybe more, he knows more how to do that than most people do, certainly more than I do. But but we can go into this frontier, It's and it's it's kind of fertile. And I, I, I encourage people to do it because I think it's really fun. 
and it creates a lot of, you know, TikTok kind of created an opportunity for people to be really creative in a different way. I think, is TikTok gone now? I don't even know. It's still it's, here for now. Yeah. It's not banned but, yet. But but it, it's these kinds of platforms and opportunities, if people are really creative, um, they become a, a, a place for us to see new things. And, and, um, and so that's, that is, I'm, thank you for saying that, because that is kind of what I want people to be intrigued by is, is that the, the, um, the the fact that the videos look different they, they they don't look like i'm in my bathtub playing the ukulele you have made beyonce very proud i'm sure oh gosh that's <laughs> yeah um, i did get to i mean i meant to kind of do a little baseball bat homage thing but i didn't we never did it so the, all the, the all the videos are done without me swinging a baseball bat down the street well because i couldn't go outside right yeah, <laughs> next time yeah next time next song cycle well, thank you so much, BD, for joining us. Um, I, will the videos be available online after Monday? I think so. I think the main live stream is Monday at 8 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. And then after that, I think we'll announce that there will be, like, in case you missed it, kind of catch-ups uh, for okay, the next days. But it's very limited because there are real restrictions on the material um the licensing of the material and the other actors that are in it and the, the actors unions and the musicians unions are really strict about these things. So we encourage people to watch them on Monday with, and you know, if you miss it, you look for it on broadwaycares.org, uh, broadwaycares.org. It's on there. It's going to be on their YouTube channel. And, and when it's available, it'll be available like probably for the rest of the week. Um, but it will go away really quick. I know it's blinking. You miss it, so yeah. so yeah, don't and, miss these and, videos. And COVID days, you know, COVID days are so weird. It's, they either feel really long or they feel really short. It's very strange. Very well, unexpected. well, I'm so glad that you're using your COVID days to create yes, art thanks. for us. Yes, we should all be doing that. It's really, I highly recommend it. Really. And I really thank you guys for the conversation because I enjoy it and I love what you guys do. So thanks. Oh, thank, thank you. So you. Um, yeah. Oh, a quick question. Uh, do you yeah, have sure. any? Uh, do you have anything else you want to plug? Into because uh, I know you we can watch you on Comedy Central, Nora from Queens. Yeah. Is there anything else that? No, no. I mean, I mean, I could just tell you. I mean, just like just for curiosity's sake, I'm going to go uh, finally um, uh, next week actually to UK to shoot um, Jurassic World Dominion. It's called. That's the third Jurassic World movie, the last one, the last Jurassic World Jurassic Park movie probably ever. I would be really huh. surprised if they went any further than this. And the third one, and that's in London. I'll be in London um, for one quick trip and then a longer trip in October. But that's being shot now. One of the first movies to be in full production. And so next year, hopefully when we're actually able to go to movie theaters again in June, that that movie will be one of the big movies that is able to open because it's being made now. And that has been a huge um a discussion in the film industry about how to do that and whatever it is. It's a bunch of people, actors who have all quarantined and then a bunch of people on a crew in hazmat outfits, basically. Like really strict guidelines for, um, well, at least face masks and face face shields, you know, for a lot of people. So that's a big, um, uh, a big thing. And then Nora from Queens is going to shoot next uh, January, I think, right. of the, oh. the season two. Oh, my God. Is it going to be like Love Island where you all have to isolate on an island before you can start shooting? It might be. Right. And then what the, the, the naughtiness that might ensue as a result. <laughs> <laughs> Island, Me and Bowen. <laughs> Bowen and I are very inappropriate with one another. It's terrible that he's playing my nephew. Because we're very inappropriate. <laughs> And Bowen's also oh in. God. Bowen's also playing a guest oh, part in. in oh, my um, God. Videos. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. He's in the video that I was telling you about with the group of Asian guys. Oh my God. Like, I feel like you and Bo Bowen Yang are like, SNL. yeah, Bowen Yang yeah. from SNL. So I feel like, you, so I feel like you, like, are, are you just fated to play people who are related to each other? Uh, no, no, no. Oh gosh. Oh no. Not. Oh no. I hope not. I have this idea actually for a screenplay uh, 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 that we would be in that would be really scandalous and really funny and, and weird. Oh, I won't say any more about it than that. Oh, I, I, I'd watch it. Yeah, I can't yeah. wait. <laughs> it's like, we, we need more representation of, like, hot hot gay men. So yes, thank that's you. Right. For, yes. Hot Asian gay men. So thank you for, you know. Yes, thanks. And that, and that was part the of the thing, too. That's what I wanted to do with the, the video, too, actually. 
So you can see plenty of hot Asian gay men, a little side butt, and some Daniel Isaac in the bathtub. If you watch the us we tune in on Monday, that, that, that's the, that's what that's the best I can do to get you to watch it. Really, it's really <laughs> worth it. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. All right, and have a good one. We're, we're yes, so excited. You, yes, thanks. It's perfect. This is good timing for me. So great. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you, BD Wong. That was so much fun. Yeah, and now is your favorite part of the episode, but also lengthened because right now we're going to shout out our Patreon subscribers who, who like you, you, you've all done, you've all done so much, you know, not only have our subscribers and our readers, like they've contributed and, and helped, helped get this machine off the ground that we've created, but they've also they they've also spread our our articles and our podcast so so that 18,000 people around the world have read our website so far in the past 2 months around the I world know. around the world we're in every continent except antarctica then penguins i know we need to win them over mhm um, they we got to give the penguins wi-fi <laughs> so Thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you, for like all of your support these past two months. And if you love us, please, you know, like our articles, share them, share this podcast, review this podcast, rate this podcast. Fun fact, we finally got American Theatre Magazine to delete the old version of the podcast, which you can still find online. But when you look for us on the Internet, there will only be one Token Theatre Friends feed. So tell your friends to subscribe to the Token Theater Friends podcast. Uh, anything else you want to say to the people, Jose? Nope. Stay tuned till the end of the credits to see your name over there. Yeah, yeah. On on, on our YouTube. Yes, on the video. Yeah. Yes, and no. I just want to say thank you so much, and we hope we continue making you have less of a cruel summer. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? After listening to folklore, I'm ready for cardigan weather. When I felt like I was an old cardigan under someone's bed. Well, you girl. You me on and said I was your favorite. I am sorry. <laughs> In case that, you know, global warming keeps going as it is, it might never be cardigan weather again. So get ready to be in your bathing suit for all of eternity. But same, because <laughs> I want a cardigan also. Yep. Uh, so... So have a good week, everyone, and you know, go go consume some art. If if you feel bad, go like get 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 out of bed. Go watch something. Go listen to something. Yeah, go pumpkin spice latte your life with some folklore, or empower your soul with some Black is King. Have fun. Yeah. Okay. Bye.